Okay, I think we're ready to start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, which is Beyond Buzzwords, a guide to ethical storytelling. Um, the webinar follows the recent launch of our guide, Better Conversations About Ethical Storytelling, which you can see on the screen here behind me. Um, the guide is very kindly being hosted by our friends DevEx. You can find it on their site um, and we'll be sharing a link to it uh, at the end of the session. We'll also be telling you a lot more about it in just a few minutes. Um, but first of all, we have some introductions to do. So I'm Andy Wright. I'm head of strategy here at MNC Saatchi um, World Services. We're an agency that uh, specializes in communications in the nonprofit sector. Um, and then I'd like to welcome um, our participants to the webinar today. We've got an excellent panel um, for you all, uh, each with a very different perspective on, on storytelling and some, and some different expertise. So we have in, in no particular order, uh, Levi's Nderitu, who is an author of one of the chapters in the guide. There he is. <laughs> uh, Levi's is the Global Head of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at PATH with over a decade of international DEI experience. Uh, Levi's has worked in East Africa, Europe and the United States in his recent role at uh, Medicine Sans Frontier in Kenya. He created a DEI division, advised uh, leadership and provided training on cross-cultural competence, unconscious bias and anti-racism. Uh, Levi's is based in Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, next, we have Lola Busari, published author and lecturer in English and creative writing at the University of East London. Uh, Lola is also an education consultant with a strong focus on diversity and representation. She advises London independent schools on ethical storytelling, media portrayal um, and historical accuracy, drawing inspiration from her London upbringing and Nigerian heritage. Uh, Lola's book, Papa's Little Girls, uh, which is out, out now, uh, tackles complex depictions of black females in society. Next, we have Mehur Sultan a freelance writer and journalist from Pakistan who's with the IB Times in UK. Uh, Mehar is a freelance writer and journalist. She has a degree in international relations from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, recently, she's been working with the IB Times and has been covering stories on some of the world's ongoing conflicts, often reporting from the perspective of groups who are affected but whose voices are not being heard. Um, Mehar is also a trained chef and is currently working on her first novel. Next, we have uh, Matthew Butson, Vice President of Archive at Getty Images. Matthew has overseen the world-renowned photographic collections at the Getty Images Holton, Archety oh, sorry, Holton Archive for over 20 years and has worked at Getty Images for 38 years. Um, as Vice President, Matthew has global responsibility for direction and strategy of Getty Images archival offering, both on the stills and video side of the business. The archive itself is the world's largest in private ownership and is based in East London. In 2009, Matthew was awarded the J. Dudley Johnson Award by the Royal Photographic Society for his outstanding contribution to photography and was awarded a fellowship in 2013. Uh, and last but not least, we have Sarah Jane Saltmarsh, who is also one of the authors, the author, so also an author of one of the chapters in the guide. Um, SJ is head of thought leadership and program and enterprise communications at BRAC in Bangladesh. With over 16 years of experience in international and local communications, branding and thought leadership, uh, SJ began in policy and business development with the with an Aboriginal AOD rehab in Australia. She spent a decade in Bangladesh working with organizations like BRAC, the International Labour Organization and the UN. She's now back in Australia, uh, remotely consulting and pursuing a Juris Doctor in law. That's the introductions. What, what an impressive panel. Um, thank you all so much for being um, part of today's conversation. We're really looking forward to it. Um, and, you know, an engaging conversation on the topic to kind of further everything that this guide is about. Um, we are, yeah, and also, of course, I mean, obviously, I'm aware this is slightly funny for the panelists because you can't see, but there are hundreds of people online watching us right now and, and um, very interested to hear what we're all going to be talking about. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much to all of those online for joining. Um, we are, as I'm sure everyone is aware, just coming to the end of Black History Month, so it feels like a very pertinent time to be engaging in a subject like this. Um, the last thing to say before we start is just a few housekeeping rules um, for, for, well, for our panellists and for the audience. So, the first thing is to say, you know, we want to ensure an open and supportive environment. So while the webinar is going to be recorded, we're going to be keeping uh, what is known in certainly in the UK as Chatham House rules, which means everyone is free to repeat what they hear. But please don't attribute things to be, to anyone who might have said them, because that is generally a way of ensuring that people feel free to say what they want to say without feeling like someone might uh, follow up in a way that they don't like. Um, obviously, it's important that we're all here to listen and learn from others. So let's all listen well and respond and have a real conversation. Um, 
then to ensure i'm afraid to people online to ensure that all of our we have plenty of time to hear from all of our speakers we ask that if you have any questions or any feedback uh, please do share it in the channels provided and we'll make sure that feedback and questions reach people and we'll, we'll get back to you um with answers to your questions but there won't be kind of a, an open q a as, as part of today's session um and that is that now that the housekeeping is done Yes, we're thrilled to be hosting this webinar uh, where we'll be discussing the importance of ethical storytelling in communications. So I'm now going to pass to Maya Rampal, who's on the line, um, and she's she's who's worked very closely on this ethical storytelling guide from start to finish. Um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about it to, to set the scene for the discussion that we have afterwards. Over to you, Maya. Yes, thanks, Andy. I'm just going to be sharing my screen. Um, Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, as Andy said, I'm just going to give you a little introduction into the Better Conversations about Ethical Storytelling Guide. Um, to start, we briefly wanted to say why now was the moment for a guide like this. And it's really because ethical storytelling has been gaining momentum in our sector and beyond. Um, but before I go into that, uh, we wanted to define ethical storytelling because there's so many different ways to talk about it. And one of them is it's all about respecting everyone involved in the storytelling process from start to finish, especially those who share their stories. It's all about moving away from our biases, our assumptions and stereotypes that affect the stories we tell for the works. So it's a really, really important topic. And it's really amazing that it's becoming a bigger conversation in our sector. Since these conversations are starting, it felt like the right time to have a thorough and impactful guide that could help us move forward together. So that's why it felt like now is the time to help create this guide that really has a difference. And ultimately, this guide is all about bringing the voices of experts from the sector and people with lived expertise to the forefront, elevating their perspectives on how we can do better in our communications and storytelling. We had five principles that were at the heart of our guide um, and we think helped make it something really additive to the current conversation on ethical storytelling. The first principle was that we didn't want to be too didactic. We didn't want to be standing above people telling them how to do this. Instead, we wanted it to be about opening up a conversation that was inclusive to everyone and really put weight in everyone's voice. The second is that instead of avoiding tensions and um, plurality of perspectives, we wanted that to be really integral to the guide. So instead we leaned into those. Um, so we really encourage both in the written guide and in the videos that includes a lot of debate and open discussion um, so that we can learn through the complexity and nuance of the topic rather than ignore it. Third is we didn't want there to be a single perspective or voice. We wanted there to be a wide range, which is why we have the amazing group of authors um, and contributors that we have, um, because we felt like they have so many different areas of expertise and passion. They come from different backgrounds and they have a lot to say that adds up to even more together. Fourth was there's no one idea of what's right. There's no one thing that everyone can do that will help them get better at ethical storytelling. Instead, we wanted to acknowledge that everyone is on a journey. And by doing this, um, we can bring forward new ideas and have tools that apply to people at different points in those journeys. And last is that while studied expertise is really important, we feel like there's a lot of really great existing um, resources that do that. And we really wanted to instead lean into lived expertise, um, which is why some of our authors and a lot of our contributors um, have lived expertise and their voices really shine through. So we have our authors, but we also have around 40 contributors from the sector and around 100 people with lived expertise who shared what they had to say, either through um, talking to the authors or through focus groups that were held as well. Before I briefly go into um, what each chapter is about, um, we just wanted to share who the authors are because ultimately uh, it's their voices at the heart of everything this guide is about. Um, and we also had Flavi as editor who really brought this together as a whole. Um, for the guide, we have six chapters, 
Um, and the first one is why should we tell ethical stories? Um, this is giving context on why ethical storytelling is so important. Chalande goes into the storytelling she grew up with in Kenya, how it's so beautiful and the purpose for it is so vast. Whereas as a sector, we've become so concerned with funding aspects and audiences that we've lost the vital respect we should have for the communities and the people in them that we're actually representing. Um, so she takes learnings from different types of storytellings and shows us how we can apply that. And also um, why it's so important we start putting effort behind ethical storytelling. Chapter two, which uh, was by Levi Levi's, who's on the call today, and David, uh, both from PATH, um, is about making the case to stakeholders as to why ethical storytelling is so important. So once you go through chapter one, or you already come in with the belief that it's important, you then want to take that to more senior stakeholders and leaders in your organization so that they can invest in it and put actions behind it. So this gives you three different cases or types of arguments that you can use to do this effectively. Chapter three is all about building trust with the people that you're representing and the people that you work with in communities. So it's about building sustainable relationships that move away from the extractive approach that is currently really present. And it has some really moving stories of how when people have fallen into the extractive approach, how painful it is for both sides, and then how the author started to take steps away from that. Chapter four, which is how should we measure success, is how do we change the way we talk about impact? Because currently the way we talk about it really takes away from the reality of it and excludes the voices of the people actually impacted by the programs or by the stories. So how do we bring their voice in while also acknowledging the realities uh, of measurement? Chapter five, how can we put it into practice is a summary of the practical recommendations and tools throughout the guide. So a lot of one pages to make it as easy as possible to access the practical elements. And it also shares some really amazing existing tools for ethical storytelling, as well as some new ones that the authors and contributors created to fill in any gaps. And lastly, chapter six, which was written by Sarah Jane, who's also here with us today is about when we look forward, what are some really progressive ways we can dedicate ourselves to storytelling? So the main two um, ones this chapter looks at is how can we use different formats for storytelling beyond the written word? And how can we also learn more about participatory storytelling, which is all about integrating the storytellers into the process more? We also just wanted to give you a quick look at the guide itself. Um, we have uh, interviews throughout and usually extracts that you can then click out to to see the full version. Um, we've got videos integrated, which you can also see on our YouTube channel, which are usually led by the authors and lean into the tensions. We've got a lot of images to support interviews and the stories. Um, as well as outputs from the focus groups with people with lived expertise from all over the world. And while we have some really amazing quotes and new ideas shared, we also wanted to lean into the practical. Um, so we have a few new tools. So for example, on the top from chapter six, Sarah Jane created this amazing inspiration station, which puts forward positive case studies that we can aspire to. So it's not just pointing out what's wrong, but looking at what we could do right. And below that is a example measurement framework on how we can um, change the way we measure things qualitatively and quantitatively to include new perspectives. Um, so this is a very touch the surface look at the guide. If you're interested, we'd really recommend um, giving it a read because there's so many really deep and beautiful insights in there that help move this conversation forward. Um, I'll hand back to Andy now. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Maya, for that uh, that excellent summary of the guide. Um, yes, we really do encourage everyone to to take a look online, and and um, we, we believe it's going to be useful for everyone, whether this is something you've done for decades or something that you're new to. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna I guess begin our conversation now and, and start putting some questions to our panelists. Um, I'm gonna ask the first question to to Levi's because as you were the author of one of the chapters in the guide. Um, so, yes, Levi's, you wrote the chapter about making the case for ethical storytelling. I guess one of the reasons that we did that is that we know there are there are so many people out there who are maybe working within an organization and, and they're trying to make change happen. 
you know, they believe in this kind of thing, but maybe they're looking at their organization, wishing it were more progressive or, or more uh, on board with these ideas and, and may, perhaps not knowing where to start. And I, I think your chapter was kind of written with that in mind. So, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about the chapter and, and what you think needs to change in terms of how we advocate for ethical storytelling? Thank you so much, Andy. It's such a joy to be here. And it was such a delight to work on this chapter with my colleague, uh, David Burgo, who is our head of brand and, and comes at PAT. Um, so this chapter basically is looking at three cases, the business case, uh, the moral case, and the social cultural case. Uh, and the idea here is um, leaders, most of the leaders are interested in how does this drive business value, right? And, and so basically we delve into uh, the details of how uh, ethical storytelling actually is good for the business, is good for the organizations, because at the end of the day, leaders care about, you know, the, the, the bottom line, right? Um, and so looking at, you know, donor shifts that have happened, we are seeing now increasingly donors requiring and demanding organizations to actually represent communities and to center communities. So that's key. Um, and other aspects of, of the business case. But also the business case brings on its own challenges because it's it it can become expensive uh, to actually do stories ethically, right? It means, therefore, you know, hiring uh, people in countries where where the work happens. Most of the time, we know people in communications are in the global north. Hello, and but we need to change that. <laughs> we really need to change that so that we have the communicators coming from you know the countries where uh, where this work is is happening. And then uh, there are people who be like, that is too capitalistic. That's too focused on, uh, on, on the bottom line. Then we have the moral case. And the moral case, basically, it's the right thing to do, right? It's the right thing to do. It's about social justice. It's about representing people as who they are and honoring who they are and their stories, right? Uh, so the moral case is also key. And, and one of the tensions we also brought was with the third case, which is the social cultural case. And we had a debate here is social cultural case similar to the moral case, for example. But you know, my proposition, uh, and I really pushed for this, was that um, societies are different, you know, and what is moral in one society might not be in another society. For example, when you think about polygamy, for instance, um, in, in African countries, in my country, uh, Kenya, for example, that's allowed, you know, by the law. And in certain societies, uh, you know, it, that is not allowed. So the question of morality, again, uh, is, is, is debatable, honestly, and therefore, um, the, this case looks at how can we honor the stories in cultures and contests, uh, contexts which are different from from the ones that we're used to. So and 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 so basically, this the, these three cases. Um, what we say in the chapter is that they cannot be used in isolation, you know, not one case is not enough. And I think there's a combination of all those cases. And then the other part of that is also really providing tools on how can you actually go about it? How can you convince leaders, you know, what do you need to do? So we'd recommend people to actually go and check out the toolkit on DevXP. It's rich uh, of, of, of wisdom that we share from our experiences. <laughs> Over to you, and brilliant. Thank you, Levi. Well, I, I actually um I have another question for you, but maybe is a little bit lighter. So there's one that again I'm I'm trying to um make everyone want to go and check out the toolkit. There's there's a wonderful moment in one of the videos where Levi's is talking to other people who who do jobs like like his, um and he suddenly kind of reels back laughing and goes, "Oh my God, this is like therapy." Um, and it really kind of made me laugh that, that that was how you found the experience of participating in this guide. Um, and on the one hand, that's funny. But I think on the other hand, there's a there's a serious point behind that. And I was wondering if, if you'd just like to talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, what happened with the development of this toolkit is the community, the people brought together. And sometimes one can feel you are alone. You have all these crazy ideas of how to change the world, right? And how to better represent people and communities. However, I think just being in a community, 
all these people coming together was very therapeutic, at least for me. And I hope also for those who are here and for those who are in this call, that you find a sense of community in conversations like this ones. I know there's a LinkedIn page as well that was created on, on this guide where you know all these crazy ideas that you have, bring them in there, bring it to this community, right? And you know, uh, there's a quote that says, it's only the crazy people who actually dared and changed the world, right? And then I think in this moment, uh, I want us to feel such a safe space in, uh, in this place that all the questions are valid, uh, all ideas are valid, and this is a safe space to you know, really air the gray areas of ethical storytelling. Mm. Mm, absolutely. I wonder, does the, do any of the other panelists want to come in at all? If you feel, feel no obligation, but I wonder, is that what Levi's talking about there is something that resonates with other people? Oh, good. I'll press, I'll press on with questions. Um, so uh, moving around then to uh, Sarah, SJ, um, in the toolkit, you write at one point about um, the philosophy of, of your organization, BRAC, and I guess the sort of the humanist values that are there. And, you know, I think you say, you know, our work comes from the belief in the power of communities to, to change their own life. Um, and there's something I found really interesting that I guess I think what you're saying, and please tell me, but that behind um, the approach to storytelling, there is just an innate belief about people. And that once that belief is there, not only does it inform the program work, but that's translating into into the kind of communication approach too. I'm, I'm sure I haven't done that justice. Can can you tell us a little bit about that <laughs> yeah. philosophy and how it translates into communication? Absolutely, and you you did a good job. I think the um the, I mean at at, at and you're right. It's it's much bigger than communications as such. Um, the the core of of everything that we do at at BRAC is this idea that every person you know if if they're given the tools and the platforms and the knowledge has the potential to change their own lives so it's just like a a light switched on and of, of yeah i mean that that permeates through through all of the programming that we do and that and that overlaps into the way that we tell stories so you know i think it it you know it's um like i yeah i said i um i live for a decade in bangladesh and obviously if you're you're living in anywhere you know that has a past of colonization particularly um you know you're it's, it's people it's communities it's whole countries that haven't um necessarily um you know had a history of sort of um that that belief being part of it and and development in general it it doesn't often um you know it doesn't often give people the, the tools to think they can change it's more like continuing something um so that you know the ngo can stay in business Whereas BRAC is very much about saying, you can do it, you know, you need to say, you need a big push, you need a big asset, you need a bit of training and, and, and you'll be fine, you know, you can do it. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's very much, I think something it, that was really kind of, um, when, we, when we were doing the toolkit, one of the first things I was saying was, you know, you can talk about things like, you know, I don't have the money or I don't have the whatever, but it's the mindset that's the most important. You know, it doesn't really mm. matter about the budget or the time that you have or whatever. Like, do you go in there genuinely believing that that person within them has everything that they need? And it's just that they, you know, need connections like any of us would to a few people or some resources or some training or whatever, but that they have it um, inherently the capacity within them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, you're saying that how we understand people is, is just fundamental to ethical storytelling and that we have to have a belief in their potential and ability if we're going to represent them properly um, and not reduce them to anything, I guess, less than they are. I, I wonder that, yeah. that feels like a really interesting time to, to bring Matthew into the conversation. Um, you know, good a good time to talk about Getty Images and how imagery is an essential part of, you know, positive and accurate uh, representation in storytelling. Um, maybe, maybe first of all, because I'm aware people might not be familiar, maybe first of all, you could just tell us a little bit about the archive. Um, and how it's used by storytellers worldwide and, and then maybe i'll ask a couple of other questions yeah i, th I think if i actually spin that round and uh <laughs> sure go 
go backwards in a way, um, I think it's really important because I'm slightly sitting on the other side of the fence that, you know, obviously Getty Images, we don't tell the stories. Our customers and end users uh, tell the stories. So we provide uh, imagery uh, for others to tell their stories and obviously, um, you know, on a commercial basis, but um, we've got several projects on a not-for-profit uh, basis, which I can uh, uh, talk to later. So the editorial decisions uh, lie externally. Um, and as long as their stories are not defamatory or discriminatory um, and free from uh, political in inter uh, interference, we can't interfere. Um, having said that, in, in terms of what we're providing them to tell their stories, uh, that's where we can help. So, you know, our you know, our, uh, we've got a strict co code of conduct. We have uh, an editorial integrity policy that not only our own staff photographers adhere to, but also, you know, our partners and our contributors. Um, so, you know, we're looking at balanced coverage. Uh, we're looking at um, impartial coverage. We're making sure that everything's factual. Uh, so, you know, the dates, the locations, who's in the picture, et cetera, et cetera. And that might seem a really, really minor point, but that's really, really important, not just for now, but going forwards 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, uh, so that information is correct. Now, my area of expertise is in archives uh, and history. You've got a much, much more difficult, um, uh, it's not a problem, um, it's an opportunity, if anything else. So um, where I'm where we've, we've done a lot of stuff um, around uh, looking at our, our, um, our various archives and what we cover, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but as you go back further in time, um, it's shot from what we call the white gaze. You know, editorial division, books, newspapers, magazines, um, they were, you know, uh, white organisations, white photographers, white caption writers. So you're getting really one perspective. Um, you're not seeing things the other way. There's, there's an amazing picture of... Um, the Daily Express photographers team in 1960, we've got this, there's 120 photographers. They're all white and they're all men. Uh, so, as I say, and now whether, you know, everyone's got their biases um, and not everyone's a racist, et cetera, et cetera, but you are coming from one perspective. So from our perspective now, what's really, really important for us um, is to unearth, I mean, we've got a, a massive, massive um, uh, archive of, you know, access to 135 million images, less than 2 million of those are actually digitized. So we're, we're on a sort of archaeological dig to unearth um, pictures of of key you know decision makers and trailblazers um, and it might be women it might be um, uh, uh, black people it might be uh, Asian people etc cetera, etc cetera, um, to try and redress that balance so when we provide these images via our site and also via our, our not-for-profit uh, projects that we've got going uh, people can use those images to tell their own stories but start to redress the balance um, and that's really really important and we found some amazing Amazing stuff, you know, um, the first black footballer, the first uh, black nurse, the and it goes on and on and on. And a lot of these people have forgotten in history. So we're sort of hopefully, you know, raising raising that uh, and, and putting these people in the spotlight where they should be. Um, but as I say, it's not our place to, to interfere and tell people how their edit editorial decisions should be made. Um, but uh, what I love about one particular uh, project, which is our Black History and Culture collection, is that anyone can go in there, they can uh, apply to use the images to tell their own stories. And not just a book, not just a, a teaching aid, it could be an artwork, it could be a video, it could be um, uh, an installation, it could be lots and lots of different things. So that education perspective across across the broad range of, of the arts, as it were, makes sure that everyone can get involved. And it's not just about reading some sort of um, academic uh, text that that is only accessible to some so so say so i'll get off my uh, soapbox but um i think as i say it all boils down to trust at the end of the day and it's our job to be um not only impartial um and um uh, and a balanced view um but uh if we're going to provide our imagery, uh, that sort of integrity and authenticity is is absolutely um, uh, essential. You've got your hand up, Levi's. Yeah. There's two Already. hands. I think uh, Mayha had she she ever so slightly got yeah, her hand Mayha up. Yeah, Mayha started sooner. first. Mayha could go yeah. first, and then I could go next. Please Thank go ahead, you. <laughs> um, not just. Uh, I just wanted to build on the point that Matt was making around, um, you know, images and 
to my mind, uh, you know, as Andy said, I'm, I'm a journalist and writer. Um, and if I, I, I said this to Andy when we when we spoke briefly before the call, and you know, for me to come into uh, this discussion about ethical storytelling, it, it's hard for me to do that without the context of what the headlines are right now. And and you know, just not going into the specifics right now, but just generally to Matt's point, just about. It, it reminds me just, you know, how democratized sort of images and access to images has become because of mm. media and, um, you know, in, in I'm what, 38 and in my lifetime, um, for a large part of my growing up, we only had the main major news networks and that was your source of information. And now, um, of course, there's a lot of issues around authenticity and, and validity of, of news and images. But, you know, the more the more I see how reporting is done, I think that's that's valid even for the major organizations but what's changed especially with images right image images you know picture can speak a thousand words um is the people historically with less of a voice and less access can and find it easier to get their side of the story out um because you because you you know you, you see a lot more of what is a war zone what are the people who are literally experiencing it going through i mean uh i think your famous example of the Vietnam War, where actually the the support of the American public went way down when they actually saw these images, and they actually saw, of course, also also the data of like like climbing U.S. military casualties, but also like all those images, and and now in twenty twenty three, that's even more that's even more you know um, valid, and it's it, in some cases I think it's it's leading to valid questioning of kind of mainstream um, framing of narratives. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, I think it's an interesting parallel, not one that we've talked about a lot on the guide, but it is um, it is very much centering the voices and experiences of the people that the story is about in a way that often those, that, that was somewhat absent from the way that things are covered in the news. Definitely. So, uh, uh, Levi's, uh, I think you had a comment as well or a question. Yeah, sure. Matt, thank you. I'm curious about artificial intelligence and how um, you know, your organization and with the larger sector uh, is, is using AI to really drive positive storytelling or mm -hmm. removing the biases uh, within the algorithms. What are you doing about it? And you now I'd like to hear your reflections on that. Yeah, I think it's really important to say that um, from an AI perspective, yes, uh, we've we've sort of entered the marketplace, as it were, but that's very, very much from a creative uh, stock perspective. You know, that has no no part, no place at all in editorial um, imagery. Um, that's got to be real, um, authentic, as I said. On the creative side... Um, I was speaking to Andy about this uh, yesterday, uh, and you make a, a really good point about positive uh, portrayal, is that um, there's a lot of, hmm, there, there are AI engines out there who have basically scraped the web uh, for, you know, for for their learnings and training and this and the other in order to create X imagery. Um, who whatever people want to um, want to create. Now we've created our own sort of AI tool, but purely from our imagery. So there's lots of issues there around copyright. So that's all great. Um, you know, we're paying our photographers, et cetera, et cetera. But because our stock photography is a port a positive portrayal of life. Um, and also it's quite naturalistic now. It's not like the plastic stock of eight, the 80s and 90s. Um, so, you know, if, if it's a family around a table, for example, that's, you know, um, enjoying themselves and, and that sort of uh, family atmosphere, it's a positive portrayal. So if people are used to use utilizing AI to create their imagery, they're creating it from positive imageries. So they're going to create uh positive imagery from that so you know um yeah you know history has you know there's some dark 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 points in history but like with our, our historical um uh, collections that we're talking about um um we've tried to balance that uh in terms of positive portrayal and yes you know it's but it's not just about civil rights marches and struggles and and uh, dare I say it, far worse than that it's about ordinary people doing ordinary things uh, as well and so therefore i think on the creative stock side as though as long as people understand and know that that's an image that's been uh, created by uh, an ai tool then um you know it can only be a positive thing i'm, I'm sure there'll be lots of people out there who want to use it otherwise uh, but from our perspective um it can only be a positive thing Thank you, Matthew. Uh, please, everyone. Oh, 
Mahal's, Mahal's right hand. Is that I'm the, so sorry. I'm finding the new. Uh, Please I'm come in. Absolutely. We really want conversation. Um, yeah, but no, just quickly a point because he said something that really um, struck me is that around, you know, kind of um, ordinary images and, and just family sitting around uh, a table and, you know, we're in the, in the 2020s now, we, we, we like a more naturalistic style of photography. Again, it, it goes back to my, my first point about actually, uh, and you can see it now, you can see it now in, in you know, it's newspapers, magazines, Time magazine, I think most recently. I mean, who are the people and who are the families who get the privilege of those photographs and to be, um, you know, represented in a certain way. Um, you know, it's just, it's a point about how do we humanize or dehumanize people and how that actually, you know, images again, is, is just so powerful without even saying a word, it's who gets to tell their story in that way. So it's just, it's just reminded me of that. Mm, no, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Thank you. This is a great conversation. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to try and uh, make sure that we're including everyone. I've got a question for uh, SJ and then one for Lola afterwards. Um, SJ, in one of your conversations in the toolkit, um, it's, it's, well, it's one of the videos, and it's, it's there's a sort of you're in conversation with Peter Torres, and there's this part that sort of made me laugh where you're both you're sort of reflecting on communications in the sector and sort of saying, "Isn't it a shame that things are often just a bit boring?" And I, I and, and I should sort of clarify that I think what you guys are saying is that there's this weird way in which people so often seem to revert to a very similar formula and you see things that you feel like you've seen before and there are without realizing it it's almost like there's this muscle memory or there's these tropes and they just sort of um they seem to keep coming up so yeah i'd love to sort of again this is one of those ones where it's something that made me laugh but behind it there's a really quite serious point uh, to be made so yeah i'd love it if you could uh, tell us all a little bit about this yeah i mean isn't it like it's just they're so boring I mean, so much of the time, right? I mean, that was one of the things we talked about at the start of this toolkit was like, they're, they're boring, they can often be damaging and they're depressing a lot of the time, right? Mm. And yet, you know, I like, yeah, you know, like, like, um, like everyone in this panel, you know, have worked, you know, for years in that space and I've found the most inspiring, interesting, cool people that, um, you know, that I've ever met, right? And, but, so I guess one of the, um, yeah, one of the kind of, I think, tasks in this toolkit was to bridge some of that gap between these really awesome individuals and the really vanilla, like, boring way that they're presented. I think one of the, um, you know, when, you, you know, there's this kind of idea that you go from A to B and, like, you were terrible and then you know a light switches on and then suddenly everything changes um but it doesn't talk about all of the setbacks that you have along that time and it's all of those nuances that make stories mm -hmm. relatable um and that make them interesting right so yeah i think we um and a, a lot of the time when we're like uh, one of the uh, kind of uh, brac initiatives that i talk about in there is we took it upon ourselves the last year we turned 50 and so we did 50 of these stories um, across the organization and we we made it but we were like we don't want to be inspiring we don't want to feel pity we want people to read these and want to meet these people like there to be enough in there that you think hey I want to hang out with that person because that's often not the goal right and yet um yeah so so yeah it was I think that conversation was about yeah they're boring and that's the worst because these people are really <laughs> interesting like surely we can change that yeah yeah, I, and I, I think that's such an interesting, but like, you know, obviously we don't always have the time to tell lengthy stories because that's the nature of storytelling, but we can be aware of the whole person, right? And we can be oh. aware that you can't reduce someone to, oh, this is a disabled person. Oh, this yeah. is a, a mother. And as if that's all they are, as if there isn't a person. And it there. might be more important that like, they like Taylor Swift or like yeah. they have a cut a certain way, you know, and they're relatable things. So you realize like you, you might be speaking about someone in a refugee camp, but they don't have to be the refugee, you know, they can be like, you know, another guy who likes playing football or used to be in a band or and suddenly you're like, oh, that's a person, not just kind of a label. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then Lola, I wonder if this feels like a great time um, to bring you into the conversation a little bit, perhaps. Um, well, I suppose, again, I've got a couple of questions, but it would be great if you could kind of begin by telling us about um, the inspiration behind your book, uh, Papa's Little Girls, yeah. and then maybe we'll, we'll talk more about representation in there awesome. yeah 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 yeah. thank you I think it's um you know what we were just saying about 
representations of people as a whole person, not the, you know, as Sarah said, not the refugee, you know, it's, um, <laughs> it, I think it's really easy to fall into that, that trap because, you know, like with the images that we've seen for decades, it's, you know, a picture is worth more than a thousand words. So sometimes it's hard to, or difficult to dissociate from that. And it's not even, you know, like a black or white thing because even me, I've fallen into that trap so many times. I remember the first time we went to Nigeria on holiday and um, <laughs> I was telling my sister to oh, pack, like you pack your, the clothes that you don't really care about, you know, because, you know, we've seen what Nigeria is like on TV. And when we got there, we felt so like, you know it was it was bad it was so underdressed it was it was <laughs> the world that I saw there was not the world that I saw whilst in England you know it was a complete misrepresentation of what life was actually like there and um you know for me personally you know when we spoke yesterday I was concerned about the whole is you know is this performative is this real because I was you know I actually struggled about coming on to to be part of this because I didn't know the the end goal of it all yeah and you know I've had experiences in the past where you know that thing of not being represented as a whole or the idea of tokenism it does get very jarring from time to time <laughs> so I mean for me writing um Puffer's Little Girls was my way of expressing that you know there are so many sides and facets to people as individuals you know you can't just say oh this is a portrait of the black woman you know there are so just like every woman there is so many different sides to everyone you know and I mean Papa's Little Girls was actually written quite a long time ago it was I think it was like about 12 years ago or so but since becoming a mother it's I feel like the messages in it have become even more important to me today because now I'm super conscious and very intentional about the things that I expose my children to. I have boys and, you know, what their representations or their ideas of what a woman should be or looks like or, you know, in all the various forms. And, you know, in the past, I've been accused of dressing like a middle-aged white woman. And, you know, I was like, well, what does, what does that mean? And if I dress like a typical black girl, what does that mean too, you know? So for me, the inspiration behind Puffer's Little Girls was just ensuring that there are multiple voices out there when it comes to representing who we see and the characters and the lives and the stories that we're exposed to. And Chimamanda Adichie spoke about the danger of, a, of the single story the one that I fell, you know, <laughs> privy to, and that so many people feel, feel privy to also, because when you are only shown one side of anybody or of, of a people, then that is what you will run with, you know, and base all of your judgments and expectations, you know, upon that as well. So it is very, very important. I'm happy that we're having this discussion and that we're doing this. And I think one of the most important things for me on about the guide is that it's not um, didactive and that it's also about encouraging conversations not about this is right and this is wrong because there's so, there's always so much gray mm. so but yeah. just the space to be able to have the conversations I think is really important so well done first of all for, for <laughs> doing it um, I, I really agree with I know I'm I'm supposed to ask questions rather than venture an opinion but uh having been involved in the guide I, I really do just agree with that because I think it's easy to just underestimate that the regularity of having conversations like this and just making sure that it remains a subject that's close to the surface and that we're all accessing often. It just means that then when you set about your daily life and you're making small decisions like how am I going to dress and what am I going to tell my kid? And while they, well, each of those things might seem small, it, it suddenly means that as a matter of habit, you're, you're bringing the right ideas to all of those those, those small moments because again so, alone there's something you were saying yesterday I thought was really interesting about you know there is a wider societal impact if these things that maybe seem small you know they they really add up to something and I wonder, I wonder maybe if you'd just like to yeah. talk a little bit about yeah, that 100 percent. I think um it's one thing for us to you know discuss these things in our in this panel or you know with the people who are watching as well but it doesn't just stop there and it doesn't just stop um you know in the pages of a book or the pictures you see on, on television it's about how all of this is going to affect the society that we live in so for example as I mentioned with my boys 
I'm very intentional about showing them things and understanding things from their point of view and things some of some of the questions they asked me are things I've never even considered before there was a time when the boys were you know screaming in each other's ears and I said don't do that you're going to hurt your your brother's eardrum and he was like what's an eardrum so I had to like find images on google for an eardrum to explain it and then my son who's only he was only six at the time he's seven now he said oh, okay but mama can you show me a picture of an eardrum on a, on a brown ear and I was like so blown away by that because I had never even at his age even thought to do that and and then I started asking my husband who was born and grew up in Nigeria what what are your textbooks like like do you have brown images like you know is that normal but like the fact that he he had thought that and the more we do have these conversations or you know as as Matthew's saying being more intentional about the kind of images we we put out there if that's happening now at age seven or six mm. then he would hopefully be used to mm. a different world when he is 16 26 36 56 you know and that not just for him but society in general we will be more used to seeing things and it will become more normal you know as a society as a whole so um mm. there's so much power in what we're doing it's not just for these closed spaces it is truly the the, the general impact in, in society and, and you, you know you spoke also about the football that you know for young boys growing up it's not alien for them to see women's world cup on tv and things like that whereas for maybe the older generation it wasn't but the, the more we normalize these things will affect what becomes normal in society yeah yeah definitely absolutely and then so trying to make sure everyone stays involved so, so Mayhar I'd love to talk a little bit about about some of your work um I know a lot of your journalistic work is about including for instance the perspectives of women uh in stories where women are affected but their perspective is is not sort of central to mainstream storytelling and obviously something we were talking about yesterday was was kind of conflict because it is often an, an issue that is seen and stories that are told very much through male eyes probably um I was wondering if yeah could you tell us a little bit perhaps about your work relating to the Russia and Ukraine conflict I, I found that very interesting yeah yeah um so i did a so in my in my work i do you know some straight straight news reporting and some longer feature pieces and i think this conversation here is really um how i link to it is really through those kind of latter pieces where uh we're talking about like you know giving people a voice or, or letting them use their voice um so to speak um and yeah this was a conversation um with with about four four or five Russian women who uh, are based in the UK, who all happen to be uh, in various uh, positions in in the tech sector, um, just that was just playing a little bit on on the stereotype of you know like Russian tech dominance. And actually, um, when I researched it, there is also some there is also some truth to that stereotype. But I just tried to play on that a little bit to see you know these expat women and they were. Uh, of course, the the war is still ongoing, but it was, um, you know, we were it it was relatively new then, or like we were right in the middle of it, um, and I think it's just interesting because you, it's about you know we were talking about little things. Lola was talking about like the little things, um, um, and how they actually do have do do have an impact in it, um, just just hearing first-hand accounts uh, from these women, it's about how your life is affected in big and small ways, you know, from, I can't go back home to Russia, um, and my mother's being operated on to, actually, I've uh, posted something online in, in support of Ukraine, and, and since uh, possibly the Russian government is, is you know, taking note of these things, I, I would feel threatened to go home, to, you know, also kind of the flip side, where well, I I am a dual national or a triple national even in some cases, and I was hired by a tech company at, um, from uh, out of London. And actually, when the when the um, conflict broke, I I was living in Russia, and actually I found myself out of a job because they said that they couldn't hire Russian contractors, and that's that just blows your mind. I mean, it's you know. Um, yeah, there's so many questions, so many levels for somebody to go through that. And then um, there were some pretty sort of amazing stories, almost like worthy of, of, of a movie where, you know, you're trying to get the last flight out 
Um, you don't have access to your money because visa stopped working. And you think what's what's really all these little and big things. And then on, on the flip side, even just almost kind of, almost kind of, I don't want to say ludicrous things, but very small things like, oh, you know, Russians love Ikea and we love to furnish our houses, summer houses with Ikea and, and, and it just disappeared overnight. And that was really weird. You know, it's not to, it's not to kind of um, make light of the conflict. It's just how you're on a psychological level and a physical level on a, on a kind of environmental level, how your life changes in all these big and small ways. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just about, you know, going straight to like, the source of the story and all these little things that you you find out of, of people's experience you know yeah it's interesting hearing you talk about those details that might sound incidental it, it kind of mm -hmm. reminds me of what sj was talking about before because it, it might not be like the whole person but it is they're the kind of details that make you suddenly think about the person who's affected by a conflict like a person like you who's like got a house to decorate and has like these things in their life because yeah. so often stories do reduce people in a way where that where that doesn't exist anymore right and they are reduced to a statistic or something like that it's it feels like a really but probably certainly for journalism and probably for other types of storytelling there's a really important principle there isn't there about things that would be easy to dismiss but that they're, they're part of they're part of ethical storytelling perhaps mm. Yeah. And then just, uh, you know, um, it's another interesting anecdote one of the uh, women was telling me because she was, and it, it's, 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 you know, life is strange in the sense that this was a lady who had been basically has, has, has grown up in Russia for part of her life and but very, very international in Brazil, in the UK, et cetera. And she just happened to find herself like for the first time in 20 years, why don't I relocate to Russia? Cause you know, it's COVID and everybody's working remotely. And then she's just stuck there and she's, um, and it's also about kind of, again, what information you get, which is kind of relevant to today as well. What information do you have access to? And in Russia at the time, the information that they were they had access to was quite limited and they're thinking oh you know this will be over in a little while this will be over in days weeks maybe months like sounds sounds unlikely but maybe months and then they they had you know they went down because they took a plane down and it it uh, to do was like a ski resort and it flew over the path uh, normally would fly over Mariupol, which now we know as a major center of, of fighting and, uh, you know, theater of conflict. And then the first kind of inclination that that group of friends had, okay, maybe something bigger is wrong here, is that the, you know, plane um, rerouted to, to avoid um, flying over Mariupol. And then it's like, oh, hang on a minute, you know, so it's also interesting how you actually get to realize what the reality is around you. Mm -hmm. Mm, absolutely. Esther, I can see you've got your hand raised. Um, yeah, I I mean, I was it just it really struck me, um, Maha, when you're speaking about the feminine perspective on war, it, I guess I was thinking about the, I mean, what we're seeing all around us and um, how male dominated it is. Um, and I was kind of just thinking, um, personally, I had an experience um, recently with it might like on one side of my family, we've talked a lot about, you know, my grandfather and, you know, the men in the family have, you know, been involved in, you know, various wars, whatever, over time. Um, and someone was saying a while ago, one of the relatives, oh, you know, your grandma actually um, during the war used to climb through the Alps um, with supplies for the troops and she used to go through enemy lines. I was like, where's, what? <laughs> what mm. she's got a way cooler story and so often all of those stories don't get told so i mean kudos yeah. to you for writing some of them I mean, that's a perspective i don't think we we hear about enough at all thank you yeah thank you yeah amazing stuff and then i'd love to um uh, matthew maybe it could be i'm conscious we're, we're drawing near the end um i'd love to I suppose it feels like we've spoken about such great principles and it's really interesting to think about like what can we all do because it feels to me like we've had a conversation of, of people who clearly agree with these issues and we're, we're all on board and then you know making sure that that translates into action and you were telling me yesterday about so many things that Getty is doing and so maybe it would be great, it'd be great to hear about some of those but then also what are some principles that any organization can apply you know we've got hundreds of people listening to us right now working at a variety of different organizations 
Mm-hmm. How can we? I think. What can we I do? think. I think you hit the nail on the head. The the magic word do. Uh, don't just don't just sit there. Don't just uh, let it wave over you. And you know, dare I say, it, when you know the whole um, Floyd and and Black Lives Matters. Um, happened and, and the outrage that was uh, around that and uh, you had lots of statements from lots of corporate organizations and well-meaning you know and, and heartfelt and this that, and the other but ultimately what they were doing was not a lot if nothing at all there was a lot of internal stuff and a lot of learnings and, and training and all sorts of th- things which is great which is fantastic uh, whether some of those have sort of since dissipated I, I don't know certainly not from our perspective but um but again, it was it was trying to come up with something that would 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 I don't know not necessarily change the world. Obviously, we'd love to change the world in a positive way, but just to do stuff to put something back. So I've sort of mentioned the um, um, black uh, culture and collection, uh, black cult- yeah, historical black uh, culture and collection uh, that that we put together, and and that's you know accessible to not for profit organisations to tell their own stories, this that, and the other. The other thing that I think was uh, fantastic, which we we're continuing to do, which will have an effect, um, is uh, something called uh, picturing black history. So we uh, partnered with um, Ohio State University and other organisations, and it was simply uh, someone telling their story, um, and it might be a photographer, might be a, a writer, might be uh, an academic it might be you know a pop star or whatever but just to tell their story and uh, obviously there's you know the, the the common theme there was was black history and basically where we came in was to provide free imagery to tell these stories so a number of these essays have been uh, published on online um so there's some books coming out of those things but most importantly and this is really really exciting some of this now is eking into the um educational system uh, so you're starting to get some of this stuff in in textbooks you know to, to teach kids and about about their history basically which is fantastic so that's one thing the other thing that uh, we're doing and, and sorry this sounds like a soapbox thing and it's not just you know rah 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 but um uh, so we we provided a grant uh, to the uh, historical black cultural black uh, colleges and universities in the states HBCUs as they're, as they're called. So this grant would allow um, a number of these universities to digitise their own um, their own archives. We get to represent it, and the money generated from that goes back into the um, educational system to basically put black kids through college. So it's self perpetuating, um, and and it's it's you know when you think yeah. That, that horrible, nasty commercial revenue is being used to actually put a black kid through college. It's really, really <laughs> satisfying, uh, which which is great. And again, it's you know it's, it's self perpetuating. So as I say, again, you know, getting down off my soapbox, if if so many more organisations who have the bandwidth, the global organisations that the other do stuff. Don't just say stuff and sit there uh, and feel satisfied and smug or whatever. Actually do stuff. There's uh, so much you can do, especially those in the media with picture archives, with um, video archives, with, you know, textual archives, whatever. Um, so so that I think is really important. And, I, you know, everyone on this call, you know, you've written something, you've uh, you've created the toolkit, you've done, you've done stuff. Um, and it's not just about sitting there, as I say, um, telling people uh just just yeah pithy statements on a on a on a website somewhere absolutely thank you matthew Lola, I, I sorry see you had your hand. Yeah. <laughs> and i know you've also got um well you you have a role in, in the curriculum too yeah 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 i was going to say um i'm definitely what matthew said about doing stuff and also making sure that people feel valued as well i think sometimes with events like this, most of the impact is generated from the fact that it's the people with the lived experiences or the people who are doing stuff that when they tell their stories, it creates the most impact. But it's also really important to to make it clear that those people are valued and those individuals, or when you're going into these places and you're taking pictures of people or highlighting their stories that they feel valued as well so that they don't feel like they're just a cog in the chain as Mm -hmm. as difficult as it is because you know there's always the bottom line and everything but it is very important otherwise um people won't feel as inclined to want to come forward and share their experiences as well so and even like in terms of academia from my perspective um showing that the people are also represented in the the text and the things that they're studying as well is really really key so yeah 
Thank you. And uh, mm. let's keep, all keep doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lola. Uh, Mehar, I think you're going to get the last comment in as, as we draw close yeah. to an end. Really sorry, very quickly, because um, I just did want to get a comment in, as I said earlier, about, you know, what, what's going on right now around, and we're talking about a lot of nuances in terms of, you know, ethical storytelling and people's voice and all that, and I just wanted to, and what we can do, and I just wanted to say, you know, again, as a journalist, what I see in the media right now, like some really basic things about, you know, reporting unsubstantiated claims or or you know, not not challenging claims. And that's just really basic. And I think in the nonprofit sector or the news sector, any, anywhere, even in your day job anywhere, uh, that's, you know, have got, uh, do something as Matt said and kind of have the courage to, to, you know, challenge those claims. So really briefly, I'll just say, for example, the BBC, which generally we are used to trusting with eyes closed, recently, you know, had to issue a retraction because they had described, in their own words, just quoting them, they had described a, a pro-Palestinian demonstration in London as a pro-Hamas rally. And then they had to issue a re retraction, etc. But I mean, I think in the news and in, in PR so often, the damage is done once you, once you put out that claim. And it's just in terms of, you know, what we can do as individuals just to be comfortable to, to challenge claims that we see from, from normally trusted sources, that's all. Absolutely. Thank you. What, what an important point to end on. Um, I'm conscious that we've run a little bit over and I'm sure the, our expert panel are extremely busy people who have other things to do. So I'm going to wrap up quickly and just say uh, thank you all so much for participating. We we really do appreciate it. It's been, been a really rich and engaging discussion. Um, I hope the audience agrees. Um, yes. And then please to everyone, um, if you haven't already, do have a look online at the guide. Um, we're all really proud of it. We think it's, it is really valuable. And it is as it is as good as the amount of participation it gets because the more conversations like the one we've just had that everyone is having you know as as the norm in their work in their daily life with the organizations that they work with and like Mehar's just said when it's time to challenge it's good to speak up and challenge but then also when it's just time to include someone who's never had these conversations before it's good to make it really easy for them to get involved too because the, you know more and better conversations is is hopefully how how the progress that we all want to see is, is going to happen so yes, thank you so much to the panelists. Um, we'll uh, we'll wrap it up there. Goodbye, thank everyone. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye bye.